Alrighty, we might kick off today's session. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's STEM Plus X webinar. My name is Kimberly Valeni, and I will be your moderator today. Um, since graduating from QUT, I've been working as a front-end developer at Deloitte Digital, where I create lots of fun and exciting websites and mobile apps for big clients, small clients, anyone and everyone. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and I'm keen to see where my career goes with my STEM Plus X combination. Um, I'm super excited to also be working with careerswithstem.com to bring these webinar events to life. Um, it's my passion to inspire more young Australians, especially females, to explore careers in STEM. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the Turbal and Yagara people as the First Nation owners of the lands where QUT now stands and all of the lands we are joining from today. I acknowledge our First Nations people as the original STEM innovators and traditional owners of Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. If you're joining us live, welcome. Uh, please get your questions ready and tell us where you're joining us from in the chat. Uh, it might be which school you're from, uh, which part of the country you're in at the moment, or I'd love to know the First Nation owners of the lands where you're joining us from, if you happen to know it. Um, we have attendees here joining us from Tasmania. We've got a couple from Brisbane. Great to see that the spread is far and wide. Uh, today, we have an awesome lineup of impressive math and data professionals who have combined their love of numbers with their X, which is their passion, a problem they're trying to solve, or another discipline. You'll hear more about our STEM plus X formula later on. The panelists are standing by to share their career path and answer your questions. And if you're watching this from the Careers with STEM YouTube channel, thank you for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe. So in this webinar, we're celebrating the latest issue of the Careers with STEM magazine, the math and data issue with a special section on economics. This was delivered to Australian high schools in mid-May, 2023. So be sure to look out for your copy. If you didn't get it, you can check out the digital or e-edition at careerswithstem.com. Careers with STEM is a one-stop inspiration hub for high school students about careers in STEM, which are growing twice as fast as non-STEM jobs and are found in every sector. In the pages of this bright, fun magazine, you'll meet real-life career role models showcasing the range of exciting and sometimes surprising career paths available in math and data. You'll also find out who the employers are, starting salaries, and some of the projects that will need your STEM skills. Whether you're working on developing new technology, conducting research, or solving problems in any field, you'll need a strong foundation in math to be able to understand and work with complex concepts or solve problems. There could be a career in math and data out there for you. The exciting part about STEM skills is that there will be careers in five years time from now that don't even exist yet today. So the opportunities really are endless. Today's webinar is brought to you thanks to our sponsor, the Queensland University of Technology. Also known as QUT, it's a university that I can definitely vouch for because that's where I studied. Um, I graduated at the end of 2021 with a double degree in information technology and creative industries with majors in computer science and interactive and visual design. QUT offers bachelor degrees in mathematics and data science and is known as the university for the real world because of the approach of embedding real world learning into their courses, as well as linking students to real world projects through work integrated learning initiatives. Before we meet our panel and explore their careers, we wanted to share Careers with STEM's secret formula. We call it STEM plus X, where X is your passion and interest another subject, a big opportunity, or a life-changing goal. It's just like mathematics to keep on theme with today's presentation, um, where X is the unknown variable that we need to figure out. Um, think about tech plus agriculture equals smarter farming, or science plus business equals new space rockets. Um, engineering plus health could equal new medicines, and maths plus shopping could equal happier customers and less retail waste. Take myself as an example. My personal STEM plus X formula is technology plus design, which is the backbone of why I studied my double degree of computer science and interaction design at QUT. 
STEM plus X can lead you to some surprising careers today and into the future. In today's webinar, you'll meet three amazing STEM professionals who have combined maths plus X, carving out super interesting careers in finance, modern slavery, and ecology. You'll meet Kanu, who first combined maths plus marine life, and now maths plus banking. She's a data scientist who works at Westpac. We also have Adriana, who is combining her skills in data and human rights. She's working on a project that uses AI to help combat modern slavery. And lastly, we'll chat to Michael, who is maths plus education, plus fishing, plus public health. Um, he's a maths professor whose research tries to save species from extinction using mathematical models. Once you've heard from our panelists today, you might be inspired to find out more about combining maths and data at QUT with your ex for an amazing career. More information can be found on the QUT website. Alrighty, on to our first panelist. Um, Kanu Agarwal is an associate data scientist at Westpac, where she was previously a data specialist graduate. She graduated from QUT with a Bachelor of Mathematics and Information Technology in 2020. She then completed her honors in mathematics in the field of applied mathematical ecology. She is passionate about empowering women and underrepresented minorities to study STEM. Outside of work, Kanu likes spending time with friends, going to the beach and playing the guitar. Um, welcome Kanu, thanks for joining us in the webinar. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your day-to-day -day looks like since graduating? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, now, I work as a data scientist at Westpac, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, day to day can be very different. Sometimes, you know, you're full of meetings, which I'm sure you agree with, but I think we have a really good team um, that I love working with and just like interesting problems um, that we have. So yeah, that's like. Fun. Um you quite recently graduated from university. So can you tell us about what your favorite subjects were in high school and how that helped you decide your degree? Yeah, absolutely. So I always loved maths and science um, as a kid and in school. And I think a lot of the advice that I was getting and I think that people get is if you like maths and science, you should study engineering. And I think um, that that's not always the best advice um, because there are so many different career paths that you can go into. You know, as you were saying, Kim, you can combine all those different skills and passions that you have. Um, and so I decided to study maths and computer science at uni um, because actually I went to this um, event at QUT um, where there was like different um, mathematicians speaking and one of them said if you like maths just study it and I thought why not um, so decided to go with maths and then just picked up computer science as a double degree because I thought that programming would be a useful skill to have um, so yeah that's my journey fantastic um, going then from high school and into university what was your experience like studying maths at QUT and what was your university life like? Yeah, I, well, I absolutely loved it. Um, like, I think uni isn't just studying. Like, I was loving, you know, doing my degree and studying what I really enjoyed, but loved being a part of all the clubs, um, like women in tech and women in maths and all of that stuff. Um, and then I also did like a summer research project, um, actually with Michael, who was my supervisor, um, kind of on yeah in applied mathematical ecology which was something very new to me at the time because I didn't realize that you could apply maths um, to that kind of area so that was really interesting and I really enjoyed it so then decided to yeah do an honors in that same area but looking at like Great Barrier Reef um, management and yeah I, for me it was just really really interesting because it was very different to what I was studying, but I was applying that skills and knowledge that I had learned to something um, which was very like relevant, real world stuff. Um, and yeah, ob obviously always has loved science as well as growing up and, you know, watching David Attenborough documentaries and all that. So it was, yeah, nice to combine those two. Um, and yeah, I just really enjoyed it. Yeah, great. So after I think four or five years of university for you, you've now landed a role mm -hmm. at Westpac. Um, yep. How did you get into your current role there? 
Yeah, so I actually, um, so I had like a Westpac Young Technologist Scholarship whilst I was studying, which is really just a scholarship for people um, who are doing technology, technology related degrees. Um, and it's not just like a merit scholarship, it's also, you know, they try to pick people who are really passionate about STEM. Um, so that's pretty cool. And so I'd kind of already heard about the Westpac grad program. But I think what really drew me to it was that they had a specific data graduate program because kind of when I was reaching the end of my degree, I was like, okay, like I want to do something that's still relevant to maths. Um, I don't just want to be doing any, you know, IT or engineering, like that's not what I've studied and that's not what I want to do. And so there were one of the few companies that had kind of a dedicated data program. Um, so like, yeah, spent a year doing that um, and now and working as a data scientist, which is pretty cool. And it's a lot of fun, right? Because you're kind of never, you're never going to stop learning in your role. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you got involved in clubs such as Women in Maths, uh, Women in Tech. You actually founded the Women in Maths Club at QUT. Um, why do you think diversity in STEM is important? And what other involvements did you have in this space while you were at QUT? Yeah, I mean, I think it's so important, um, like, to encourage everyone to just do what they want to do. And I think um, it's it's a big thing of, like, you can't be who you can't see. Um, and so I think for a lot of young people, if, if they're not seeing, you know, people that look like them doing jobs that they want to do, they might be put off by that. And so I think encouraging diversity, um, you know, starting young is really, really important. Um, and so, yeah, like we had a women in tech club at QT and a women in science and, you know, GEMS, which was gender, gender diversity in engineering. Um, and like it was, I think it was about time that we started a women in math club as well. Um, and so, yeah, got together with some of my friends and some people from my degree. And I think, yeah, we just went and did it and it was really fun. Um, yeah, and then also, yeah, I was on the Women in Tech exec, which was, yeah, a really good experience. And it's just great to, like, have that community of people um, as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that kind of community that you build in your university life really helps you elevate as you're going into your career. Yeah, um, Great that you've kind of initiated yourself for the first, I think, two or so years since you graduated. Um, what's next for you in your career? Yeah, so I'm definitely really enjoying where I am now. I want to keep doing that for a few years. And I'd love to do a PhD one day, um, you know, in applied maths or something related to that. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking is what's next, but I haven't thought too far ahead just yet. Always time to think it through. And yeah, PhD sounds great, but thanks so much for sharing your story, Kano. Um, Lots of insights that even I've taken in. Um, if there's any questions for Kanu that you have, please pop them in the chat. Um, but now I'd like to invite up our second panelist to share her story. Um, Adriana is an artificial intelligence researcher at the QUT Center for Data Science and is the project lead of Project AIMS, which stands for AI Against Modern Slavery at Mila. Adriana grew up in Romania, but her studies and work have taken her to the UK, France, Hong Kong, and now Australia. Adriana has always had one foot in the world of social sciences and one in the world of mathematics. And this is the foundation of her current research, which involves combating modern slavery using data and AI. Adriana is listed as one of the 20 rising stars in AI ethics 2022 and won the UNESCO International Research Center in Artificial Intelligence Award in 2021. Um, wow. Adriana, what an impressive career you've got so far. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you've come to the position that you're in now? Hi, uh, Kim and everybody. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm also joining from um, QUT. Um, well, of course, my journey somehow starts even back in high school. Um, I was... Uh, liking mathematics um, and studying mathematics and computer science. 
Um, and uh, however, there was something missing in this formal uh, educational system, um, which was not um, answering my desire to understand a little bit more about how society works. And I was trying to compensate that with volunteering. So that made me want to do um, a quick switch and I changed from math and computer science to study philology, which is the study of languages, um, a very, very different trajectory. And um, when I went to university, I decided to study international relations, but I was lucky that uh, there were some uh, quantitative courses um, as part of this degree that I really enjoyed and that allowed me to continue um, improving my maths uh, skills while uh, predominantly focusing on understanding how to design policies and everything that goes into that. And that for the last 10 years uh, and more a bit, uh, that's kind of um, been the trajectory that ended up um, really taking shape when I discovered about the issue of modern slavery. And I thought, okay, how can I combine the skills that I'm learning, especially the quantitative ones, into creating evidence to inform policy and legislation um, to eradicate this crime? And, and that's what I've been working uh, on for quite a few years now. Yeah, interesting. If we kind of backtrack to when you mentioned that you studied, uh, sorry, you were good at math and computer science in, in high school. Um, where did you want to take this originally? So when I, uh, in Romania, if you're really good in school, um, you want to go into the best um, class or course and you know that the best students will all go to math and computer science so I didn't really think much about it I was about 16 when I had to um, when I started high school and um, I thought well that makes sense I went I was studying math and computer science I was doing well um, at that but I was not necessarily having a plan or I couldn't even picture myself really want to be an engineer or I, I didn't really have that vision when I was about 16 17 um, and I think that was for me even an, an advantage because that offered me that type of flexibility to keep experimenting with the subjects that I did even switching in high school which was pretty shocking for my parents and my teachers to do such a drastic change um, from math and computer science to languages um, but for me actually it took me completely out of my comfort zone and I realized how hard social sciences are to master um, and since then in university and so on I was always curious and picking completely different uh, subjects which all uh, contributed to having this opportunity now to work at the intersection of disciplines and um, have an opportunity to innovate. So I I think as any, um, I mean, not any, because I know some students really have a clear vision. They want to be a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer, and that's really great for them. But for the others that don't, like myself, that's also fine. Yeah, I think it's really reassuring that when you were kind of in the shoes of the high school students who are joining us in this webinar, it's okay to shift and study different areas if that's what you're interested in. Um, you mentioned that in high school or towards the end of it, you had a change of direction with an interest in policy, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So in um, similarly, um, in Romanian high schools, it's more about the collective of the students that you are studying with. So it was either studying math and computer science where all the best students are. And it's really important here. I think one lesson that I've learned since then, and I've took it with me, it's really great to be in an environment with really smart people, even if you are the least smart in the room, because they will take you up with them and they inspire you. So that was my considerant when I switched. I knew I wanted to study more um, humanities and social sciences, but I wanted to be in a very high, comp uh, good co collective. So that's why I chose uh, philology, the study of languages, because this is where the other really good, talented students were. Um, but I didn't have that vision. Like we'd never studied politics or international relations, anything like this. We didn't have one course in high school. So when I actually went to union, I chose that. There was for the first time when I did a course in politics, but I knew it was the right thing for me to study because um, it, I was just curious. I, I said, I, I really want to understand how that works. So when I even switched um, uh, course, it was mainly deciding um, 
to still be in a good collective rather than having a vision that I'm going to be a politician or a policymaker or anything like that. Yeah, so then you studied um, a bunch of languages that like you just said. Um, and I guess you've taken those languages that you've learned into many areas geographically. Um, you've studied in a lot of areas in many places of the world. Um, what's a key skill that you've learned and made use of throughout those experiences? Uh, those exper experiences are so enriching and I will always encourage everybody if there are opportunities to go study abroad or an exchange, anything that will take you out of your comfort zone um, and put you somewhere that you haven't been, you will learn so much. I think if I wouldn't know exactly if it's a skill, but one thing that I have been conflicted about and tried really hard to do while I was moving from country to country, from environment to environment, different social classes, all these different um, um, experiences was to allow yourself to adapt and take in as much and learn from those areas but do not change your core your authenticity um so i don't know what adaptability while keeping uh, authentic it's that uh, lesson that i i got so to give you an example I know many, many places that I'm learning even here in Australia is this, this seems to be the same. They are all these pre um, this ideas that if you speak with a very posh English accent, you'll be perceived better and it's good for business. But I would always say, and as you can tell, I would always want to keep my accent as authentic as it is, because this is how I can express myself the best and I can be myself and that uh, people can read authenticity. Um, and I would rather um, have that than trying to mimic something that doesn't come natural to me. Yeah, that's great advice about being true to yourself and, you know, kind of the center and everyone will adjust around you. Um, you mentioned that your current work involves combating modern slavery. Can you explain what this is and how you're using AI to tackle this issue? Sure. So um, modern slavery um, is defined as a situation of exploitation that a person cannot refuse because of threats, coercion, deception, and um, abuse of power. So you could take many forms such as forced labor, forced or uh, several marriages, debt bondages, um, Forced commercial sexual exploitation, children of um, exploitation, um, uh, human trafficking for organ extraction. So it really takes many, many uh, forms in which somebody is completely depleted of their freedom um, and are unable to, to make decisions. Um, and there are some really great resources, and I can put some in the chat, where um, organizations are trying to capture how many people are enslaved in the world. So we know that around 50 million people are enslaved today out uh, here in Australia, having of over 40,000 um, individuals living in the city situation of modern slavery. And we might think at times that slavery happens only in developing worlds, but as I said, it can also happen here. But it's not only that uh, people are being exploited within this the, the area, but us, everyday people, we are connected with this crime through the products that we are consuming. So in Australia, for instance, there are billion of dollars of imported goods that are at risk that somewhere in their supply chain are developed uh, or, or produced using forced labor. So the top type of products here in Australia that are at risk of being produced modern slavery are electronics, garments, solar power, textile, and fish. So you can think already with the products that maybe you have in front of you, how many of those could be at risk of somewhere being produced by slavery. So the government is responding to this. They passed a law asking companies to publish statements where they declare how they're addressing slavery in their supply chain. And those statements are um, in thousands being published each year and the government and the civic society doesn't have time to go and read it or as consumers. So with artificial intelligence, we are able to put all these statements together and analyze what companies are saying they're doing to tackle this issue. And then hopefully we can provide that information in a more structured way so we can use it when we make decisions about the products we're buying or the businesses we're engaging with. Yeah, wow. It's such fascinating work and it's an industry and an issue that I had never really looked at before so in depth. So yeah, I'm really keen to kind of follow your story and see where that goes. And I guess my next question for you is what what's the next chapter look like for you? Are you going to well, be relocating from Australia, moving somewhere else? <laughs> 
Well, for the next year, at least I'm not. I'm really, really enjoying um, um, being here I, and also doing my PhD. I am, I'm still having two more years uh, of my PhD to do, and I'm really just hoping to enjoy this, um, this, this time. Um, throughout the, the last uh, few years, I've always had to kind of chase the next thing and build that security and now I finally feel like I can really take time to enjoy and one thing that I have done and I'm I, um, planning to do next is always invent my job um, and as you said Kim at the beginning the job that I've been having for the last um, seven uh, to eight years they never were there when I was in high school or when I started my bachelor. So I'm thinking in two years time, I'll probably take a next step towards something that doesn't even exist today, um, but hoping to keep building on this work that I, I've been developing over the last few years. How exciting. Well, we can't wait to keep an eye on where you go from here. Thank you for sharing your story Thank with you. us. Um, now I'd like to invite up our final panelist to join us. Um, Michael Bode is a Professor of Applied and Computational Mathematics at QUT. Um, his PhD in Applied Mathematics saw him predicting what fish populations would be like in the future. And he also uses math models to try and save species from extinction. Uh, but beyond his research, Michael says teaching is one way to have a real impact on people's lives. And he enjoys working with students who haven't liked or done maths for a very long time and showing them it's actually not as complicated as they think. Um, welcome, Michael. When we introduced you earlier in the webinar, we mentioned that your STEM plus X formula is maths plus education plus fishing plus public health plus anything. Um, could you tell us a bit more about yourself and why your STEM plus X formula has many, many variables involved? I guess the easy answer to that question is I'm much older than everybody else. And so I've just been doing this for a lot longer. Um, and I guess, you know, we could talk a bit about abstraction. Um, and one thing that mathematics does really well is it thinks about problems in a, in a very abstract sense. And in a, in a way, questions about fisheries management, like how do we make sure there are enough fish in the ocean uh, going forward are a bit like questions in public health management. How do we try and reduce the prevalence of diseases, the burden of disease on particular countries? They look like different questions, but from a mathematician's perspective, they're all kind of the same question. And so one of the things I like a lot about mathematics is, I guess I have a bit of a like a, a peripatetic mind. I like picking up stuff and dropping it and picking it up and dropping it. And so mathematics lets me, you know, move to a field that I probably don't have a lot of understanding of it first, but I bring with me, I guess, a familiarity with mathematics and a bit of experience at turning problems that sound like word problems into mathematics problems, then offering a solution. And I like the way the maths allows me to, to think about different things every year. Yeah, great. I guess that is the foundation of the STEM plus X formula, that you carry that STEM part with you while you figure out what's next. Um, so yeah. we heard that as a child, you did a lot of fishing and you were decent at maths, right? How did you combine these two? I think you mentioned uh, fisheries science. Yeah, I was, um, I love fishing. I think I wanted, to, I wanted to be a fisherman. I think you'd asked me around the age of like 16 or 17 what I wanted to do with my life. It was fish all the time, but I wasn't very good at fishing um, for a variety of reasons. And I was okay at mathematics. And so I started looking around for ways in which I could talk about fishing and talk to fishermen, uh, but do so using mathematics. And it turns out that they're everywhere. Like basically the essence of managing a fishery is to say, okay, well, I've got a good idea of how many fish there are in the ocean this year. But what I really want to know is how many there'll be next year. Because I have to tell the fishers next year how many fish they can catch and to do that I really want to know how many fish there are going to be because if it's going to be a bad year for fish because the weather conditions are bad because recruitment so you know new babies haven't really come up into the population or because we fished too many this year unexpectedly I want to try and reduce the catch quotas for next year and that's all mathematical forecasting it's all numbers you know I need to know I need to be able to guess how many tons of fish will be in the ocean next year because I want to tell people how many tons they can take from the ocean. And so I, I got involved a bit in the fisheries of the Great Barrier Reef. 
And another aspect of that, which is not quite so sort of um, uh, mercantile, is the Great Barrier Reef is managed with these protected areas. They're like national parks, but in the ocean. And they take certain reefs and they put them out of bounds for, for fishes. And the question about where those reserves go and how big they are and how many there are, those questions are all quite mathematical, like how many, that's a number, and how big, that's an area. And you know we need to think about those questions using quantitative tools, using STEM to try and say, well, how much is enough? And at the moment, we've got about 30% of reefs that are you know, under protection under these national parks. And there's a really good question now about whether we should make that bigger or not. And to answer those questions, like you really have to engage with a lot of data. You have to use a lot of forecasting tools and all of these involve in some way or another mathematics. And I guess that's a STEM plus X thing. But one thing I would say is, you know, mathematicians should never think that you know, mathematics itself gives them some sort of privileged position in that plus point. And like moving side to side across different fields with a sense of humility about how hard these problems are and how they're all a bit different and how there are angles to the problem that are very hard to answer and require collaboration with other groups, fishers, for example, or social scientists. I think that's the best part about, you know, taking STEM to new places. It's, it's, you know, really good collaborations with people who have great disciplinary knowledge outside of STEM and bringing them together. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting that you've gone from your career aspiration as a fisherman to now being a maths professor at TUT. It's a bit of a um, downshift. With the role in... <laughs> uh, yeah. Some say better, but I don't know. I guess now you can keep fishing as a hobby on the side. Um, with your role now as a professor of math at QUT, what would you say to someone who is probably in high school and is finding maths a bit of a challenging subject? Yeah, all sorts of things, I guess. Um, I guess I'd start by saying that, you know, everybody finds mathematics challenging. And sometimes the only difference is whether people are willing to admit it. Sometimes people find it challenging and the way that they deal with that is they pretend that they're cool. It's all great. I can understand all of this. And, and that, that can be a bit like um, difficult for people who deal with it by being open and honest about their difficulties. And so I think like um, if what you feel like is that, you know, I find mathematics challenging because you're looking side to side and you're seeing people who seem to be all over it it's not necessarily what's going on, right? Like you might you might be feeling a lot worse than your skills involve. And the other thing I'd say is that, um, well, two more things. One is that like one of the really big obstacles to getting competence at mathematics is a feeling of, of incompetence. It's like a sort of feeling of imposterness or of, of inability as though like the ability to do mathematics is some intrinsic thing that you're born with or you're not. And you're not a mathematics person versus you are a mathematics person. And I will say like there's a lot of social science literature around educating people in mathematics. And what it says is that, no, it's not so much, there's nothing innate about mathematical ability, but there is something really counterproductive about feeling like it's impossible. And so, you know, like stepping back and thinking, you know, anyone can do mathematics and I'm not a person who can't do mathematics. It's a hard thing to say, but it's, it's actually true. And the final thing I'd say is, that, you know, when you leave school and when you, you leave university, um, mathematics is super useful. And a lot of people have already quit because they found mathematics too hard or they thought they couldn't do it. And so your actual need to be super competent in mathematics isn't that high, not as high as you might think. And I, I know this personally because I'm not very good at maths. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't a great mathematician in high school. I, I was, certainly wasn't a great mathematician in university. But it turns out that I guess my openness to new ideas and to applying maths was more useful. And so more than like your ability at mathematics and more than the degree to which you find it challenging, I think the important question is whether you find it interesting and whether you find yourself drawn to it. And those two things can be quite separate. And I guess, you know, if you feel like you want to move away from mathematics because it's a bit hard, you should first ask yourself, do I find it interesting? Because if you do, then I think it's worth sticking with because in the end, that's a much more useful sort of relationship with mathematics than some measure of competence, which is probably not accurate and probably not all that relevant. Yeah, that's a great way to, to word it. I never thought about it that way, whether it's interesting um, and not, you know, as challenging. Um, maths as a topic is such an abstract concept. How has maths evolved in the past couple of years and what keeps you excited about it? Yeah, I mean, maths is super abstract, right? Like, and it's weird because we think about abstraction as being 
an impediment to utility. So like the more abstract a concept is, the less we can use it. And like, you know, with abstract art, right? Like if I were to, if you pay me to paint a picture of you and I produce some cubist or um, illusionist output, you probably wouldn't recognize yourself in it. And so in some fields, we think of abstraction as being taking something further away from reality. The mathematics abstraction is how we engage with reality in a really useful way. So like, okay, um, way, way, way back in the past, uh, we start, we, we came up with numbers like a long time ago. And numbers, you know, everyone listening to this knows what numbers are and they can add numbers and they can subtract numbers. And we don't think of that as being hard, but that's like fundamentally the biggest abstraction jump we do in mathematics. Like the first guy in a field who's got his sheep and he's making sure they aren't eaten by wolves, he counts them every night. And I reckon the first time he decided to count them, the guy next to him was like, what are you doing? What am I? I don't count sheep. You can... This is crazy because what he's asserting when he counts sheep is that every sheep is the same sheep. But like you talk to you talk to a sheep and I reckon they'd be like, no, we're really different. That guy over there is, you know, he's, he's got black uh, fur and he's, you know, bigger than me and he's older than me. Don't lump us together as sheep. We're, we're unique, different beings. But a mathematician said, no, no, no. All trees are trees, I'm going to count them. All sheep are sheep, I'm going to count them. And in doing so, that's a huge abstractive leap. Um, and in doing so, in, in taking that abstraction and saying, I'm not going to recognize all the, the unique nature of all these sheep. I'm going to call them all just identical, interchangeable sheep. Um, the, the process of mathematics allows us to make sure that every night there's the same number of sheep in the, in the meadow and that we haven't lost any. And if we have, we can go get them. Anyway, so I guess like most of what we do in mathematics is a process of abs abstraction. So when I, I, I do some work with, um, I think you mentioned like public health. So we worry about anemia as a disease. Anemia is when your body doesn't have a lot of iron in its blood. It makes you feel lethargic. It makes you find it hard to concentrate at work or at school. In some places in the world, because of poor nutrition or maybe a high prevalence of diseases like anemia or maybe genetic factors like thalassemia or, or sort of genetic blood disorders, there's a lot of anemia in the the world's governments and the world government would like to try and fix that. But like anemia is a really complicated thing. Like we, we, we have a name for it, but it's an abstractive name. When we count it, we count it in a very abstract way and we compare between countries. We say like more anemia in Malawi than there is in Namibia. And those are really big abstract jumps to take. And then we all sometimes go even further, right? So the, the, the government, the World Health Organization, every year does a process called the Global Burden of Disease, which talks about how much the population of the world and the population of its countries feel the pressure of disease on them. And that's a number we really want to know, right? Are we getting better? Um, are some countries falling behind and some countries going ahead and can we learn from the countries that are doing well and try and avoid the pitfalls of the countries that are failing? But to do that, to calculate a burden of disease, we have to add together, uh, for example, somebody's lung cancer they got from smoking and somebody's anemia they got because they couldn't eat enough iron-fortified foods. And those two things are fundamentally different, but there's a process of calculating what we call the burden of disease that statisticians and mathematicians do, where they assert the presence of burden of disease. And so they like they add up all these very, very, very different things, just like the sheep in the field are very different. But they say, okay, no, we're going to actually add together, you've lost your, your finger now because of a workplace accident, and you over there have had you know depression because of uh, you know, job loss, those two things can be added together to a burden that can be comparable. It's an amazing process and all sorts of controversies exist around it, but fundamentally it's a process of abstraction. And yeah, I reckon mathematics is, is, is not even a science in many ways. Like you look at the STEM moniker and M is separate from S, right? Because mathematics is, is really just like the art of abstraction. And science is often the art of like the truth and discerning that thing to be true or false. But mathematics is often not so interested in truth and, and falseness, but just about the consistency of different abstractions. Sorry, that was a weird diatribe, but um, thanks for sticking with me. No, that's a perfect analogy. And I think I love the way that you phrase it as, you know, math is an art of abstraction. Um, it's such a fascinating way to think about it. Um, it sounds like you've had a tremendously massive and positive impact on people and planet throughout your career. I guess my next quick question for you is what's what's next in line? Oh, doing more, I guess, doing better. Plus, like personally, in my lifetime, I'm just, and it's interesting to be part of a massive shift, but like mathematics has really changed and I'm way behind. Like my whole education is based in a world that precedes data science. 
and machine learning and it's just a computational mathematics that just now dominates. And so I have to learn that sort of stuff to be relevant and useful in the future. So that's, I guess, my goal. And to give you one example, because Adrian talked about philology, the study of languages. When I was growing up, we had these computer models that were based on mathematics that tried to translate languages from English to French, say. And mathematics is a rule-based, so not like mathematics, mathematics is rule-based and language is rule-based, right? When I construct a sentence, I have nouns and verbs and adjectives and I interact in certain ways. And technically speaking, there's like a logic to what I'm saying. And my brain is amazing because it can work that logic out. And your brain's amazing because in real time, it can translate it into meaning, whatever that is beneath the surface of the language. But our, we, so the mathematicians, we had these, these models of languages and we thought that they were really getting to the, the heart of how a, a language works to create meaning and, and to communicate it. And they were terrible, terrible, terrible models, but we understood them. They were like noun, connected adjective to modify noun. Anyway, along comes Google and they produce Google Translate and it takes a machine learning approach to the same problem. And we have no idea how it works, right? It just... It took the entirety of the United, uh, the, uh, the European Union's laws, which are translated by experts into multiple languages, fed them through a machine learning algorithm and spat out this tool that could do almost flawless translation. And it doesn't, the tool clearly understands what language is because it can do a translation, but we don't understand this tool that we've created, even though we understand how to make the machine learning thing that makes the tool. Anyway, that's not the mathematics that you will do at school. It's not the mathematics that, you know, universities often teach. That's the mathematics of differential equations and of Boolean logic. And instead we have this new stuff now, which is definitely mathematical because mathematicians produced it, but it is nothing we understand. And I need to get my head around that or risk complete irrelevancy. So that's my next goal. Yeah, great. I think, yeah, with anything to do with STEM and maths, because it's always going to be constantly evolving. So like I said to Adriana, we're never going to stop learning, right? So yeah, we're keen to see where it goes. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Michael. Thank um, you. Wow. What an inspiring trio of people that we've had today. Um, I'd love to invite back all three panelists um, to the spotlight. Um, and we might give you a bit of a question for each of you. Um, my question is, can you give us your best piece of advice to your high school self? And we might go in order of the panelists. So Kanu first, then Adriana, then Michael. What is your best piece of advice to your high school self? Yeah, um, I think mine would be don't be afraid to try new things because um, I think I probably kind of stuck to what I knew um, was until maybe my second or third year of uni that I started branching out and doing new things and I think you learn so much and I think Adrian kind of touched on this before, you know, you soak up all this knowledge um, from other people and, you know, learn from different perspectives that you wouldn't usually, so... That would be my advice. Um, mine, um, I was writing this down in anticipation, so I'm hoping I can go through it. But I thought if I'll talk to myself or with the student um, now, I'll say, stay curious, um, be really empathic, especially if you're traveling internationally or you go to visit other communities that are different than the one you grew up in. And like, still, it's not old fashioned to say work hard, uh, because the world is very competitive and you have to prove yourself and to be happy with your, your results because nothing really comes out of nowhere. You have, if opportunities come, you have to be prepared and you have to make the most out of them and always prioritize your mental and physical well-being because if you don't have that, you won't be able to do the, the rest. And uh, maybe uh, my other advice would be um, don't be afraid of networking. And what I mean here is that, for instance, if you have questions or you need some support, um, look for it and there'll be people to answer. You can come, for instance, write a message to me on LinkedIn. I'll be extremely happy to answer or I say, oh, I'm not the best person to answer, but Kanye is, and I'm sure she would be happy to pick that up because it's not about paying it back it's always about paying it forward so I cannot I got lots of support throughout my journey but I can't go to my professor in uni and give they did not need anything from me but they will be happy to know that I'm paying this forward so if you need support make sure you ask for it there will be people to provide it to you and then when it's your turn you can do that for for the rest thank you um I would like to say it's been 30 years since I started high school and I can't remember what <clears throat> I was thinking then or what I'd tell myself. So 
Um, I, I would I'll kind of beg off the question, but I will say, as to Adriana's point, I reckon you got you got to work hard. Like I think life is vaguely competitive, and there's only a finite number of options available. But like, what I I guess I I now know is that forcing yourself, like you think I've got to I've got to work hard, right? And you can make yourself work hard. Like you can force yourself to get up in the morning. And different people have different abilities to like force themselves to do uncomfortable things, like have cold showers or wake up at five. But like to 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 work hard, I think consistently and over time, it helps more to think about what could motivate you to work hard and to try and work with that. And so like beating your head against a wall of a, a subject that you don't really like or that you don't think you're going to do later on, you can do that and you can force yourself into it. And you can even force yourself quite a way along a trajectory that starts there. But it's sometimes better to think about yourself, like, why am I doing this? What do I, what do I really want from, from this, this course, this degree, this topic, this book? And to try and listen to that answer a bit and, le and follow it. In instead of like thinking, you know, in an abstract sense, I know I shouldn't say this because I'm pro abstraction, but instead of thinking in an abstract sense, where do I want to go? Asking yourself, you know, what do I like and what motivates me as a person and, and what's going to help me get up in the morning early or study for those extra few hours or, you know, you know, try harder and practice for that 15,000 hour at some task. That's like, I think, in the long term, more important. And there's, I will say, the one thing I do have some perspective on is that like life is a bit of a marathon, not a sprint. And it's hard to think about the long term from the beginning, but it's there, right? You can outpace yourself, you can run too hard, and avoiding that is a really helpful long term strategy. All fantastic advice. Thank you so much to the three of you for sharing. Um, also, thank you to the panel for joining us, and we look forward to following the rest of your careers. If you've been if you've been inspired um, after hearing from Kanu, Adriana, or Michael, make sure to check out more stories of math and data plus X careers in the latest issue of the Careers with STEM magazine. In these pages, you'll meet math and data specialists working in diverse areas, from bankers who are using data to support customers affected by natural disasters, to a meteorologist who uses numerical weather prediction models so we can plan our wardrobes with the Weather Zone app and a data analyst who works with charities to help them report on their impact, which can secure more funding for them. You can find it all at careerswithstem.com. You can also head to careerswithstem.com to search careers and people by your favorite X, such as animals, business, creativity, crime and justice, and much more. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 1st of November, and this one will be celebrating the release of the Term 4 edition of Careers with STEM Technology. In this special 10th edition of Careers with STEM Technology, we look back on how technology careers have changed in the past decade and how they're going to evolve in the next 10 years. Make sure you register now, um, either through this QR code or on careerswithstem.com. And that brings us to a wrap for today. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Queensland University of Technology, and thank you to everyone for attending our webinar today. We wish you all the best with your careers and your STEM plus X journey.